Good evening, everybody. My name is Roxanne Chabot from RBC Consultants. Welcome to our Skin Chat webinar this evening on the role of ceramides in skin barrier integrity, what you need to know. As guest speaker this evening, we have Dr. Daniela Antello. Dr. Antello is Professor of Dermatology at the State University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. She's also a dermatologist at Antello and Saerpe Dermatologia and at Centro de Tratamento de Vitilago. She's adjunct professor of dermatology at the Universidade de Estado in Rio de Janeiro, as well as chief of cosmetic dermatology, sector of hospital Universitario Pedro Ernesto. And she has gained her master degree and PhD of dermatology at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. We also have as guest speaker, Dr. Carmen Gloria Gonzalez. Dr. Gonzalez is a pediatric dermatology. She did her fellowship in pediatric dermatology at the Feinberg School of Medicine and Northwestern University. She's a member of the American Academy of Dermatology, the Society in Pediatric Dermatology, and the European Society of Pediatric Dermatology. She is also associate editor of Practical and Conceptual Dermatology Journal. We would also like to thank our sponsors this evening. CeraVe, who has made this educational event possible. Before we begin our webinar, I would just like to go through a couple of uh, technical tips with you. If you're having issues hearing the webinar, you can listen to the presentation using your telephone. Just select phone call and the audio pane and the dial-in information will appear. If you're having technical issues, or also if you'd like to ask questions to our panel, please submit your questions in the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of the webinar, in one to two days, you will be receiving a survey. If you could fill it out for us, we would really appreciate it. Also, in one to two days, you'll be receiving a recording of this webinar, as well as a certificate of attendance. Again, please submit your questions on the right-hand side of your computer in the question chat pane. I wrote a little message there for you so you can see where to type in your message. We would be answering questions at the end of this webinar, time permitting. So without further ado, I am going to pass the floor virtually to Dr. Antello. Thank you, Roxanne. I feel very honored to be here and talk to you dermatologists from different countries. And I would like to thank Teravé for the invitation for this skin chat. Um, for certain, I think one of the legacies of this pandemic is that we can share knowledge in real time. And knowledge is democratic. I'm going to talk about the role of ceramides in skin barrier integrity, what you need to know. Ceramides have a proven record, but they often are often uh, overlooked and rarely explained. Next. I will highlight some features of skin barrier function and its function. For the skin to serve as a barrier, it must maintain not only its integrity, but also a good balance of skin lipids and has a proper pH. Skin barrier dysfunction plays a role in many diseases, such as atopic dermatitis and acne. Also, for a good skin care regimen, we must maintain a functional skin barrier for a good therapeutic outcome. Next. So, what dermatologists need to know about skin barrier anatomy and function? Next, please. The skin is one of the largest immunological organs in the body. Impairment of skin barrier increases the likelihood of pathogens and irritants entering and creating inflammation, leading to skin allergies, skin infection, and chronic inflammatory diseases such as atopic dermatitis. Anatomically, the skin can be divided in two layers, the epidermis and dermis, as we all know. But functionally, the skin can be divided in four layers, from the outermost to the innermost, 
we have first the microbiome layer. We, she, uh, this layer is constituted by living microbial communities. The second one is chemical layer. We have here natural moisturizing factors, defensin and acid pH, tight junction, keratinocytes, lipids, stratum corneum are important parts of the physical layer. And the fourth one is the immune layer. We have here immune resident cells that work to avoid infection, fight against infection, repair the barrier when there is some damage, and maintain cutaneous homeostasis. Next. So the stratum corneum is essential for the protective barrier function of the skin. We have the corneal sites that are the building blocks of the epidermal barrier, but also we have a water resistant layer of lipid lamella that encases the corneal sites as a corneified lipid envelope, preventing water loss and controlling barrier permeability. This cornified lipid envelope and the extracellular mortar-like multilayered lipid lamella are crucial elements of the epidermal barrier. Next. We have here a close view of the stratum corneum. We have the corneal sites as the bricks and the intercellular lipids, the lipid bilayer acting as mortar. Next. The analogy of brick and wall has been used for more than 30 years to explain the complex stratum corneum. Next, please. The barrier to penetration of irritants and external agents through the skin is located in the inner, in the lower part of the stratum corneum. The stratum corneum is similar to a brick wall where we have here the corneal sites and the lipid lamella as a mortar. The corneals, uh, the corneal sites are these flattened cells that represent the final stage of differentiation of the outermost keratinocytes of the granular layer. These cells have lost their organelle and nuclei and became enucleated and filled with fibers, packs of, of keratin fibers. And they're also surrounded by this cross-linked protein cell envelope. Next, please. This is a normal skin barrier. We have here this water resistant lipid lamella that prevents water loss and barrier permeability. We have here the corneal sites. They are held together by the corneal desmosomes. The integrity of these corneal desmosomes depends on the action of proteins and protein inhibitors. Under normal conditions, only the upper layers of the stratum corneum are degraded. Next, please. But under abnormal conditions, this barrier is rapidly degraded, creating uh, a damage at barrier function. So the skin barrier is now open to water loss an invasion of irritants and allergens leading to inflammation. Next. As a summary of a healthy skin barrier, we may say that we have here the corneal sites. They are filled with the natural moisturizing factor, a collection of natural humectants that retain skin hydration. These natural moisturizing factors are derived from pro -filigrin. 
they're also important for maintaining an acid pH at the skin surface. In order to balance the introduction of new cells into the basal layer of the epidermis, mature corneal sites are shed in a process referred to as desquamation. This desquamation depends on the degradation of these corneal desmosomes by the proteins. And these degradatory proteins are regulated by protease inhibitors. Moreover, the optimum pH of the action of these proteins is lightly alkaline, in contrast to the acid pH of skin surface. Next, please. And what about extracellular lipids? The extracellular lipids are mainly composed of ceramides, cholesterol, and free fatty acids. The natural moisturizing factors, as I said before, help maintain skin hydration. But ceramides have an essential role in maintaining the water permeability barrier function of the skin. Next, please. So, ceramides are essential for skin barrier function. Let's take a look at the composition of lipids of the stratum corneum. Ceramides are the major type of lipid found in the stratum corneum. And the ratio of free fatty acids, cholesterol, and ceramides is not static. The ceramide proportion of the stratum corneum ranges from 40 to 50 percent. Next, please. But what happens when ceramide levels are lower? Without the proper ratio of ceramides, the stratum corneum can become incompetent. Impaired synthesis of cholesterol, ceramides, and fatty acids affects lamellar layer formation, impairing barrier homeostasis, leading to dryness, irritation, erythema, and itching. Symptoms that we usually see in our patients with many different skin conditions on a daily basis. Most skin barrier disorder are characterized by a decreased ceramide content. Next, we have here a pulling question, and I would like you please um, answer. In which diseases do you think ceramide levels are lower? Please answer. We have here atopic dermatitis, acne. What do you think? None of above, all above. So atopic dermatitis, 44%. Acne, just 1%. And all of above, 54%. So let's see the next slide. Let's take a look at the pictures of the diseases that are shown here. We have psoriasis, acne vulgaris, aged dry skin, and atopic dermatitis. What do they have in common? A ceramide deficiency. So ceramide deficiency has been shown in these diseases in many clinical studies. At least seven studies are shown here. They have demonstrated that ceramide levels are lower, are reduced in patients with these skin conditions. And transepidermal water loss is higher in these patients. Also, ichthyosis. Next, please. Let's take a look at these two charts. We have here this blue one. 
we compared patients, healthy subjects, with patients with atopic dermatitis. And we can observe that ceramide levels are really lower in patients with AD. But the same occurred here in patients with facial acne. We have here healthy subjects and then patients with mild acne with a reduced ceramide content and even lower levels of ceramide in patients with moderate acne. Next, please. So both diseases, uh, we have uh, decreased ceramide content. And what are the requirements for a competent skin barrier? We must maintain a near physiological pH around four to six, stratum corneum pH. We have to reduce inflammation and maintain sufficient amount of lipids in their correct proportion. Next, please. And what about atopic dermatitis? I do not intend to present a lecture here about atopic dermatitis, but I would like to emphasize just one aspect. Next. In patients with atopic dermatitis, we have a compromised integrity of the skin barrier. As I said before, the integrity of this skin barrier is dependent on a cocktail of proteins and protein inhibitors. The balance between the expression and activity of proteins determines the rate of this formation, corneocytes shedding, and the thickness of the barrier. Let's see here, we have these corneocytes, these beige rectangles, and we have the corneal desmosome, these purple circles. In patients with atopic dermatitis, we have um, an enhanced activity of protein, degrading corneal desmosomes and impairing skin barrier. Next. Moreover, factors from the environment, soaps, detergents, may enhance protein activity, leading to breakdown of corneal desmosomes but also inhibition of lipid lamella synthesis, causing skin barrier breakdown and more damage. Next. How can we reduce inflammation in our patients? I know for sure that you all know all the steps for medical treatment of the algorithm for treating AD patients, but we must take a moment with our patients and explain, educate them regarding moisturizers and gentle cleansers as an integral part of skin care. Next. And what about acne? Next, please. Acne is a very frequent disease, right? and it's a complex multifactorial inflammatory skin disease. Its pathogenesis is not fully elucidated. We have here a high sebum production, follicular hyperkeratinization, proliferation of corinin bacterium acne, and inflammation due to lipid oxidation. But why I'm talking about acne in this ceramide lecture? Next, please. Some studies have shown that we have in acne patients an impaired water barrier function due to a decrease in ceramide content. As we can see here, comparing control subjects with patients with mild acne with lower levels and patients with moderate acne, even lower levels. So we have an impaired water barrier function in our patients. Next. Next, please. So in summary, we can say that acne affected skin, 
has been shown to have an elevated pH compared to normal skin. And some systemic and topical medications that we usually prescribe for our patients, such as antibiotics, retinoids, and benzoyl peroxide, are associated with skin barrier alteration, causing irritation and dryness. These unwanted effects can reduce adherence to treatment and therapeutic outcome. We know that over-the-counter non-comedogenic cleansers and moisturizers have been used to reduce skin inflammation. But notice that some of them may have a high pH and can interfere with the efficacy of treatment. Next, please. So, acne is really associated with a skin barrier dysfunction due to a decrease of ceramide levels. And treatment can exacerbate this dysfunction, leading to dryness and irritation. So, as an adjunct to treatment for acne, pH balance and ceramides containing cleansers and moisturizers may help maintain skin barrier function and will have a great therapeutic outcome. Next, another polling question. How can we increase ceramide levels in our skin? our skin by using standards and avoiding pH changes, by eating a well-balanced diet, by ingesting some supplements, some vitamins, or by using proper ceramide-based moisturizers. Take a few moments to answer, please and participate in our web meeting. So by using proper ceramide-based moisturizers, we can increase ceramide content in our skin. Let's go back to our lecture. So, I would like to invite you to take a moment and think that not all emollients formulations are the same, and we must choose the best options for our clinical and also cosmetic patients for a great therapeutic outcome. I would like you to thank for the attention, for attending this lecture. And next, please, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Gonzalez. She's a dermatologist from Chile. Her professional uh, background was already mentioned at the beginning of this meeting. Dr. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you so much, Dr. Antello. And now we're going to continue with the second part of the webinar. As uh, Dr. Antello mentioned, there are a lot of things that we need to know and be aware of in order to keep our skin healthy. In the second part of the webinar, we're going to see uh, what we can do to keep our skin healthy. We're going to talk about ceramides and the effectiveness that they have uh, in taking care of the skin, and especially in all the dermatoses that we have to treat every day as dermatologists. Next. And as I was telling you, we're going to see what's the role of ceramides in dermatology. And we're going to take a look at the different studies that have been published regarding to this. Next. So if we just do a basic search on PubMed, I just did a cross uh, terms in MeSH. I crossed the term ceramides and skin cream. And I found out that there are at least 17 studies currently published from 2013 to 2020. These terms are all based on creams that have ceramides uses, used in different skin condition. So let's take a look at some of these studies to see what we can find. Next. So this is quite interesting. 
because we saw that there are at least 17 studies published about the use of ceramides-based technology in skin conditions. But most of the studies are actually done or were performed using CeraVe as technology in their formulations. And just to show you, here are six examples of the studies that were done. And I want to keep showing you what's coming on. Next. There are other two studies have a, that have been recently published about the use of ceramides in different clinical settings. There's one that I would really like to advise you if you have the time to read, especially for all of us that are pediatric dermatologists or are involved with uh, taking care of baby skin, which is the one on the left, which is uh, this study about ceramide and taking care of baby skin, which was written for uh, a consensus with Dr. Lauren Schachner. He's a specialist on pediatric dermatology. So I would like to, to advise to advise you to take a look at this uh, paper, which is very nice. So if you like to take care of baby skin, please take a look at that paper. But again, I just would like to insist that there's a lot of reference out there. There are a lot of studies that are present, but most of them have been done and have been studied with ceramide technology and they're useful and different skin conditions. Next. So just in order to introduce ourselves in this, we're going to talk about three different skin conditions and their usefulness uh, as a models to see how useful it is to use a ceramide base cream. So I chose senile cirrhosis it is interesting to know that as we age, we might lose up to 30% of the production of ceramides. I chose atopic dermatitis in two settings. We're going to talk about the use of ceramides in patients that are using steroids. And we're going to use about the use of ceramides in patients that are not using any steroid as treatment. And we're also going to talk about the use of a ceramides-based cream in dry skin. Next. So this first study is a study that was recently published from uh, Dermatologic Therapy in 2019. This is a study that wanted to see what's the usefulness of a ceramide-based cream in senile cirrhosis. This is a study that was double-blind. It was performed with 24 adult patients from 50 to 70 years old, and a lot of things were measured. The parameters that were measured were Transepithelial water loss, hydration, pH, satisfaction. And this is the way the study was performed. In phase one, they were told the patients to come back after 24 hours of using the cream. Phase two, they told the patients to come back 28 days after using the cream. And the last phase of the study, they told the patients to stop using any treatment and to come back seven days after stop using the cream. And now I'm going to show you the results. Next. So, in terms of skin hydration, transepithelial water loss, and skin pH, we're going to take a look to see what happened. The first graphic here shows skin hydration. The blue line shows ceramized base cream. The orange line shows the typical moisturizer, nothing specific. So I want you to take a look at how improved was the skin hydration using a ceramide base cream. And this was maintained during the whole time the study was performed. Now, the yellow arrow always means day 28 of the study. So we get to see that at day 28, the improvement, the improvement was highly marked using the ceramide base cream compared to the typical moisturizer, and that was significantly relevant. But this is quite interesting now. After finishing the study, patients were told to come back. So at seven days of using no treatment, the difference was still present. The patients that were using a ceramide base cream still had a higher level of hydration in the skin. 
what happened to transepithelial water loss? Well, again, we see that patients here in the blue line, which shows ceramide base green, show a diminished level of transepithelial water loss. That is present here at day 28. I'm going back, I'm sorry. There we go. I'm sorry. Yeah. That we get to see here at day 28. And if we take a look at seven days after stopping treatment, it is still significant. So using a ceramide base cream not only reached a higher level of hydration that we saw in the first graph, but also help us to diminish the transepithelial water loss. And the third graphic shows that using a ceramide base cream also helps us to keep the pH lower on the skin. And that is maintained during the whole month of treatment and even after stopping using the cream. And all of these graphics are statistically significant. So the question here comes, what is happening after we stop the cream? And there are highly, basically two hypotheses here. Hypothesis one has to do with maybe ceramides are able to induce the new synthesis of ceramides in the skin. But the other hypothesis here has to do with maybe the technology of this type of cream, CeraVe, has to do with the way that we deliver ceramides makes an improvement in the way that we get to concentrate ceramides in the skin. So we don't know if this has to do with the technology that we're using in our cream or that we're able to induce a new synthesis of ceramides in the skin. Next. So just to show you the clinical parameters, this is what people want to see. This is what they care about. We just talk about the things that we can measure, but a patient wants to see how their skin look. And I want you to take a look at the upper road, the letter C, which is this one. This is a patient who just stopped using the cream for seven days. The lower road is the patient that was using the regular cream and stopped using it for seven days. And you can take a look at the difference of this way the skin looks. The upper road, you get to see the skin looks smooth, it looks without discrimination and without wrinkle. And the skin, the, I'm sorry, the picture down there looks with the skin much more wrinkled, drier, and desquamation. Next. Now, as I said, the second model that we were going to use to talk about ceramized base cell technology is going to be eczema. The first model we're going to use is to see how helpful it can be to use ceramides as a complement to treatment in patients that are using esteroids as main step treatment. So this study, uh, it had 60 subjects with mild to moderate atopic dermatitis from five to 80 years old. And they were balanced in three groups. Group one, the patients were used to use flucinolite cream, which is a uh, class two steroid. Group two, they were to use the same steroid class as Cerevil liquid cleanser. And group three, they used the same time steroid plus Cerevi moisturizer cream twice a day and the cleanser. Next. Now, I want you to take a look at the results of week four. The blue one, that's the patients that are just using the steroids. The one in the middle are the patients that are using the steroids and the cleanser. But the last bar, that's the group three. Those are the patients that are using the steroids, the cleanser, and the moisturizer. So it seems to be here that some effects are getting from the treatment of just adding a moisturizer and a cleanser. Because in this group of patients, we get to see the higher percentage of clearance. Actually, it reached 26%. Remember, all of these patients are using steroids. The steroids still are the main step treatment for eczema. And one of the things we always want to achieve when patients are being treated with steroids is try to stare, is try to save them from using steroids, try to use the lowest potency, the less amount of steroids. So 
It seems quite remarkable that just by adding a moisturizer and a cleanser, we were able to achieve a clearance of 76% in just one month. Next slide. Now, this is a different study. This is a study that wanted to see how patients were doing just by adding moisturizer and a cleanser and no steroids. So this study, 151 patients with moderate to mild atopic dermatitis, they were randomized in older than 12 year olds and younger than 12. And they were followed for six weeks. Next. So, in the left, we have group one. Those were the patients that were older than 12. And we get to see, if you see the light pink, that's the moment that the patients were recruited. Those are the symptoms that they had, they had at the beginning of the treatment. Most of them were pretty symptomatic. No treatment was started. And then they were given the cleanser and the moisturizer. And we get to see at day 42, how they got to control some of the symptoms just by basic cleansing and moisturizing with a ceramide-based treatment. If we get to see group two, we see the same tendency after 42 days of receiving this kind of coadjuvant treatment. Next slide. So what are the results of this study? This study actually shows that twice a day use of a ceramide containing cleaner and a moisturizer substantially improves skin condition in atopic dermatitis patients. This is also important to notice is that patients actually tolerated very well the products, both adults and patients. One of the main problems that we have with eczema patients is that they are actually very intolerant to most of the products. It is quite important to ask parents and patients how well are they tolerating the moisturizing because in most cases they can actually burn. Even the steroids that we use with patients with eczema might be burning. So it is quite interesting here that we get to see improvement just using the ceramide and the moisturizing creams and also that they were safe and they did not reach any uh, intolerance effects in children and adults. Next. Now the last study, uh, in this we want to talk about what's the effect of a ceramide based cream in dryness, just skin dryness. In this study, uh, there were 50 women that were followed up, they were from 30 to 65 years old, and they were told to use CeraVe in one of their legs, they were told to come back at day three, four weeks after treatment, and they were told to stop the treatment at 48 hours. After stopping the treatment, they were told to come back. Next slide. Okay, so what are the study results? We get to see at baseline, all patients showed skin dryness, roughness, discomation, and erythema. But after a month of treatment, all of the clinical parameters significantly improved. And what is even more interesting is that they remain improved after 48 hours of stopping the treatment. Next one. Now, when we see what we did, what did we get from using a ceramide-based cream, we get to see that four weeks after using this cream, the level of ceramide sweat was actually increasing in these patients. We get to see that 10% increase was achieved after four weeks of treatment. But even more interestingly, after we stopped the treatment, 48 hours with no treatment, the level was still high, at least 4% above the basic level. Next one. So what happened with the other lipids of the lipid lamella? Again, we saw that cholesterol and free fatty acids were also increased, both in up to 10%. But it was, again, interestingly, that they remained both above the normal levels. In the case of cholesterol, 7%, and in the case of free fatty acid, 5%. Next. 
And again, what are the visible results? Because this is what patients want to see. If you take a look, letter A is when patients arrive to the study. They're using absolutely nothing. And if you get to see letter D, these are patients that are not using any credit for 48 hours. And you can see there's actually a better look, even if you're not using any treatment for 48 hours, the skin still looks much better. So you get to see that there are long lasting effects in skin appearance, even if you stop using your cream. Next, please. So just some conclusions for you to take home. A healthy cutaneous barrier depends on a complex interaction between cells, lipids, pH, and microorganisms. Choosing the right products in order to keep our skin healthy is key, and probably this is the most important thing you can take home. When we advise parents or patients the products that we think are going to be useful for them, we need to be sure and we need to be aware of the things that we are actually advising them to use. Acidic pH and rich in lipid containing ceramide cleanser and emollients have proven to be beneficial to keep and restore the skin. As Dr. Antelov showed, there are many dermatoses that we know have a diminished level of ceramides. So we know now that the evidence has shown that we can actually restore those ceramides by using a specific cleanser and also creams that have contained ceramides. And again, just to point out, we need to use things that we know are safe and we know have proven to be beneficial. Next. So again, CeraVe skincare products are supported by scientific and clinical evidence in the protection and repair of the skin barrier, being also beneficial in the treatment of different skin conditions. Next. So thank you so much for your attention. Next. And thank you. Um, you'll be receiving the seminar in a couple of days. And next one, please. Next slide. Yes, please. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Gonzalez and Dr. Antello, with a very interesting and informative presentation from both of you. Again, we would like to thank our sponsors, the CeraVe, that have made this educational event possible. Uh, before we go on, we do have one more polling question for you. So, would you recommend ceramide and rich hand creams to help restore a compromised skin barrier due to repeated hand washing? If you could please select if you would or if you would not. And we'll see the results in a minute or so to see oh overwhelmingly the audience <laughs> <laughs> so let's go on to the um question period again go to the right hand side of your panel and you can ask the questions uh from our panelists so Roxanne? yes okay can i add something about the polling question Yes. Okay, I just would like to add up. Uh, right now that we are um, in COVID times, we're washing on our hands so much. So it's quite important for people to know that uh, we have to moisturize our hands uh, all day, all time. Uh, just to remember to our colleagues and people that uh, maybe they're not doctors are, are watching this. When we use the regular soap, Soaps have alkaline pH and that damage the skin barrier. The normal pH of the skin is four to six. And if we wash our hands with soap, we're gonna have at least three points of a higher pH. And that is gonna damage the skin barrier. And it's gonna last about 90 minutes in this high pH. So be very careful with that. Try to choose cleanser that are acidic use a lot of creams, ideally enriched with ceramides, and be very careful because we're now seeing a lot of eczema, hand eczema, and uh, probably Dr. Antelo can show, tell you more about it because I, I see children. 
uh, secondary to this hand wash. I don't know, Daniela, if you, you want to add something? Yes, not only atopic dermatitis patients, you know, we have some colleagues, doctors, um, people from the healthcare that must reapply alcohol, gel, and wash the, their hands um, many times a day. So it's important when uh, at least arrive at home to repair the barrier. You know, uh, otherwise, eczema, um, fissures, pain may occur. And we have received many patients, even from the private office, just um, normal people, they are at home, you know, cooking more and all the, the homework um, issues. So it's important to prevent the damage of the skin barrier. This is our new reality. So yeah. I have a question from the audience. What regimen do you recommend for your acne patients? Can I answer? It depends on the level of the acne that your patient um, is presenting. Um, we have an algorithm for treatment with medications. We go to retinoids, mild retinoids, benzoyl peroxide that has a keratolytic action and for also inflammatory diseases and more intense retinoids when there is um, many comedones but i think it, it depends on the case we can prescribe auto antibiotics or even isotretinoin but the point is that um we at the past we didn't mention the importance of moisturizers uh, in acne patients because sometimes they have oily skin or seborrheic skin and we were afraid of indicating uh, a moisturizer and it's important. It's important for a, a great outcome. It's important for avoid all the uh, unwanted effects of these medications and also important because they have a slightly alkaline pH, as we see in rosacea patients. So we have to um, protect the skin barrier because sometimes it's very often our patients will uh, call us after three, five days after beginning the medical treatment, telling, oh, my, my, my skin is very itchy is dryness, is red, is not feeling very nice. So we can avoid these unwanted effects they, uh, that can interfere with the adherence to treatment by indicating a proper non-comedogenic, a proper um, moisturizer. Thank you. Another question, at what age do you recommend CeraVe moisturizer? Uh, for me? Um, Dr. Patelis, yeah. Um, I will actually start using it since they're, you know, the, since they leave uh, the hospital, I have no problem with that. I have using it for years in babies and there's no problem. I recommend to use it twice a day. Um, actually, I recommend it for the whole family. In babies, I like to use the cream, not the lotion. And uh, I have a very good experience with that. So I, I recommend it, absolutely have. And uh, they can start using it from young babies. There is no problem with that. Wonderful. Uh, another question from the audience. If soaps are damaging the skin barrier, are you aware of any soaps or products that would be better and less alkaline? Actually, we usually prescribe gentle cleansers or thinned or slightly acidic, as Dr. Gonzalez said. The, the one that we must avoid are the products with an alkaline pH because uh, they are detergents. So they can increase protease activity, 
can degrade the corneal desmosomes mm -hmm. and then affect skin barrier function. So we uh, must suggest synthets uh, or slightly uh, acidic uh, pH soaps. Um, another question, why did CeraVe choose ceramides one, three, and six among the classes of ceramides that are present in the skin? I think we have a different types of uh, ceramides. And I guess the um, company, the pharmacists who developed the formulation can uh, answer this question better. I don't know if Dr. Gonzalez had anything to add. Well, uh, for what I have, uh, from what I have read, um, there, yeah, there are many ceramides, as Dr. Antella said, but uh, most of the studies that have been done and have um, looked for the the diminished ceramides in the different skin condition have shown that it's one, three, those are the main ones that are affected, but they're affected in different proportions in different skin conditions. So it seems reasonable to try to um, to restore those, but at least there are 12 ceramides in the skin and there are 300 ceramides all over. I mean, the body has ceramides almost everywhere. The skin just have 12. But um, from some of the studies that I, I read, um, if you see uh, ceramide one, three are constantly mentioned, they're diminished in different proportions in different conditions. Uh, six also it's mentioned quite often because six has a, a function in helping ceramides one and three uh, synthesis and function, but those are probably the ones that are most prevalent in different skin condition as deficient ceramides. I think we must uh, think that it's not only the composition by itself, but when we prescribe a moisturizer to our patient, we must think what is the type of the skin, what kind of issue that skin presents, and we must choose and know about, you know, the, the compounds of that cream because sometimes they're associated, even with ceramide-based cream, sometimes they're associated with a calming uh, molecule or with an acid or um, with another type of mm -hmm. humectant that can be also of benefit so uh, I guess uh, the idea is to um, reflect about the compounds that are pre present in the cream that we are prescribing because yeah. they are different. So yeah. um, we must choose properly. I agree. So another question, for AD patients, do you moisturize first and then apply the corticosteroid or do you apply the corticosteroid first? At first, you um, when you how, how do you do it? I'll tell you how I, I do it. The cream, first, first, the cream, because even if the, the skin is very dry, the corticosteroid or even the uh, calcineurin inhibitor won't penetrate that much. So, uh, in order to increase the biodisponibility, the bioavailability, of the corticosteroid or the uh, calcineurin uh, inhibitor, uh, we must apply first the cream or lotion and then immediately or wait a few seconds, you can apply the corticosteroid. Dr. Gonzalez? I think that's a that's a very good in pediatric dermatology to me, that's a very good question because I don't think we have an answer. Um, where I studied in uh, in uh, Chicago, what we do, and this is empirically has no evidence again, we put the steroid first, and then we put the cream, trying to seal off the steroid. 
But then uh, when I um, studied at UCSF with Dr. Ilona Frieden and Erin Mathis, they don't like to put the steroid mixed with the cream because they think they, uh, they might actually um, alter the composition of the steroids because they might lower the concentration. So they just put the steroid. They don't put cream or anything. They just put the steroid and they moisturize the rest of the body. So I don't think there's the right answer actually for that. What I do is what I was taught. So I put steroid first and I cover then to think I'm sealing it, but I don't think there's an answer. If for you it's working the way you're doing it, I think everyone has to do it the way it works for it, for everyone. Because yeah, sometimes even some uh, vehicles or compounds, they are yeah. together with a corticosteroid. If the skin uh, is very dry and has many excoriations, sometimes the corticosteroid can it increase burns. irritation. So sometimes the, the cream before can help to relieve these symptoms. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, do you recommend moisturizers in patient with hyperhidrosis? It depends on because we have hyperhidrosis in some localized areas of the body. Uh, on the hair scalp, on the axilla, on the inner groin, so and hand and feet and Sometimes they don't like the sensation because of the, the, the feeling, you know, but we, I think we must uh, treat <laughs> the hyperhidrosis properly because sometimes a uh, patient didn't even know it is a disease, you know, and sometimes they suffer for many years without even knowing that there is a treatment or a topical treatment of the application of toxin botulin or a surgery. Uh, independent the kind of treatment, I think we must explain there are treatments for these conditions. And if there is eczema or there is dryness, we can recommend um, creams. But I, we have to treat the underlying condition first. Uh, another question, in a topic of dermatitis patients, do you prefer the cream or the lotions? I always use creams, especially um, because I like the, the fact that they uh, have a higher concentration of lipids. But uh, as the patient gets older, when you have teenagers or, uh, you know, patients that are 10 or, or above, they they don't like too much the sticky sensation of the cream. So probably you're gonna have to negotiate there uh, if they will be willing to use the cream or a lotion. But if you have the chance, especially in young kids, I always use cream. And then maybe when they're older, you're gonna have to negotiate because you need, you need them to put something on, you have to. And if uh, they're willing to put something, you know, and they want to use something that's a little bit more liquid, the lotion is a good choice, but ideally always cream. So that uh, concludes our uh, question and answer period. Again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gonzalez and Antello for a very interesting presentation and enlightening. And thank you to all of our attendees for joining us this evening. Wishing you all a good end of evening. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank Bye. You thank all. you.